The Bible is nice that when it gives us it gives us a timeline. Uh, there is a little hiccup uh, in Exodus because we don't know when the two individuals are the how old they are when their sons are born. But what is nice is in uh, uh, Genesis chapter five you find out how old they are when their first born is born, and then you can extrapolate. And it works out, and Methuselah dies the year of the flood. Uh, oops. The year of the flood. Now, does he die in the flood? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, I uh, have my own opinion on that, and you can come up with your own. Uh, but then we see that uh, Noah uh, is born uh, right in here. And lives 600, or excuse me, he, he lives 650, 600 years until the flood and then 350 after that. And then he has sons that are born 500 years before the flood. And <clears throat> so we can get a, a, a pretty good age. Let me ask you a question. When God made Adam on that sixth day, how old was Adam on that sixth day? He's a, he's a day old, right? How old did he look? He was an adult. <laughs> he was an adult, right? And... Uh, So why couldn't God make the earth look old just to thwart the wisdom of the wise, you know, on the man's wisdom? Because when people look at the earth, they say, well, it is, you know, it's got to be old because it just looks, you know, so weathered and it's just been here for a long time. From the time that I went through grade school, Jason, you probably looked at this more than I have, but how many years do you think they've added to the evolutionary timetable since that time period? I mean, they've always, it, you know, though it's nothing for them to add a few million, 10 million year, years here and there, and uh, that's a big scope of time, and that's what they need uh, to try to even fathom the work of what they call evolution. Whenever you see evolution at work, it's always a degenerative process. Uh, it's a mutation. It's, it doesn't work upwards, it works downwards. Uh, whenever you see a, a species change, uh, and you see it sometimes in frogs when they uh, get chemicals in the water and they mutate and they're, they don't function the way they're supposed to. And, uh, so anyway, So Noah lives 350 years after the flood. And you know, a lot of times people don't think of this, but that, <laughs> that's a good chunk of time. That's older than the, the United States. And so as we go through the timeline and you look at these descendants, they start living less and less and less. Peleg, and it might be a little harder to see, but Peleg there, uh, his name means uh, division. And so in his lifetime, either at the time he's, I would say probably at the time he's born, because he's named that, he's named division, is probably the date of the Tower of Babel. So if we throw that up there, you can see that God confuses the language to get people to, to move away, to, to disperse. And, and uh, so that happens. Now, Noah is still alive. Now, consider, people are having a difficult time discussing anything, and so they disperse away from each other. They can't communicate with each other. These when God confuses the language, uh, it seems that that these new languages spring up, and 
there aren't people that are bilingual that can figure this out you know, until months later. So that has to, some impact, I believe, on the different stories that you that we have that are parallel in some sense to the Bible. However, they have a lot of extra things added in that seem uh, far-fetched related to the stars or whatever. So as we go here, the languages are confused. I took a course <coughs> online from uh, University of Leiden, and it was a linguistics course, and I didn't finish it. It was a difficult course, and I studied Chinese, and I studied Spanish, but I'm not good at either one of them. But one of the things I got out of the early part of the class is all linguists agree that human language originated from one common language. However, they cannot find what that language is. They can't link back, but the evidence is there that as languages uh, came out of that original language, that it seems that that other language is lost. And so I believe that when you know God confused the languages, that is a miracle there. And it is in such a way that uh, it, it, it aided to God's plan for mankind the way he wanted it to go to play out. So we see that when you look at this, when you get down to Abraham, Abraham is born at the tail end of Noah's life. And that's sometimes hard to think about when Abraham is going to, uh, moving from Ur of the Chaldees, and he goes up to Haran, and then he goes down to Canaan eventually. Uh, Noah is still alive. The Noah character in mythology, and I don't really like to call it mythology, uh, some of these flood stories, I call them legends. They all have the man that survives the flood, they call him by different names. And so as you go along here, uh, I want to try and point that out. So a myth, uh, as you can see the definition here, is a, it's a plausible story, uh, but it, it's not based on true events. And it, it's a made up story. Uh, we would call it more today, when somebody's writing a story like that, they call it fiction. And, uh, <clears throat> and, or it can be just a totally unfounded or false notion. And that's, what, like the Greeks and the Romans, they worshipped these gods that there was no uh, foundation, there was nothing to base the history on. However, in the flood stories, I tend to classify those more as legend. They have some myth intermingled in, but a legend uh, is based on some historical event or historical character. And as you look at these flood stories, there are parallels to the biblical account. Although some of the details are off and then there's other fantastical events that happen that uh, are, are uh, added in. These, I think most of you saw over there, and they, these are found by the thousands throughout Mesopotamia. And these I got from a museum that was uh, deacquisitioning some things to bring in new stuff. And these are found in pairs. And they'll find like many of them. And it will, but there's two. So they'll have two giraffes, two lions, two bunnies, and all types of animals. And they all have holes so they can be strong, probably to be worn around the neck. And it was to remember what? The flood. The animals. 
animals being saved by the flood. When you go back into this time period of the ancient world, they are uh, their culture. They are fear of the flood. And you don't just live in fear of something like that unless your forefathers or whatever have, have warned you about this and, and uh, told you the stories about it. And then these stories sort of get, uh, uh, if you will, socialized to your own beliefs. And, and I would say, how many of you have ever heard of these? You've probably never heard of these, right? And it's something that if you go to most museums, they'll have a few of these out somewhere. And, you know, it's just one of those things that just doesn't. So, again, here's an evidence that people at the time, they respected the flood. These are cylinder seals, and then the clay uh, are, are called cylinder seal impressions. So that's the impressions that these cylinder seals make. Cylinder seals have a, a hole that went through them, probably carried around the neck of the owner. And these served as signatures. And language, written language, originated from what's called pictograms. And then from those different pictures, they whittled it down to sounds and they got it down to an alphabet. So you have different types of writing. You have uh, the cuneiform style, which is sort of like uh, using a chopstick to make lines and dashes and everything like that. And cuneiform was an alphabet, but you had several languages that used cuneiform, just like uh, our alphabet is used for Spanish, French, uh, and, and you, so you can see that. But they're different languages, but it's the same alphabet in those cases. So uh, these are before the alphabets. And so people use these as signatures, and a great portion of these cylinders that they have discovered, I would say, you know, uh, probably 25% of what they find, the owner is having the story of the flood remembered in their signature. And so let's take a look at some of these. So here you have <coughs> this serpent. And the serpent is called Tiamat, T-I-A-M-A-T, and it means chaos, it translates chaos. And uh, in these flood stories, they are um, trying to subdue the serpent uh, because they blame him as the cause of the flood. So they have the sun god, and that's the national god Marduk, or Shamash, is the early on Sumerian, Babylonian uh, god that is sort of the Baal equivalent of the Canaanites. And Marduk was the national god of the Babylonians during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And the Ishtar Gate, when you pass through it, you were en route to the uh, Marduk Temple. And so there's the dragon serpent. Uh, Iana, or Ishtar, or Ashtoreth uh, is seen uh, right here, sort of riding on clouds. And so they have taken their national gods, because by this time they've already been looking at the stars and have begun the worship of the stars that you see talked about in Romans chapter 1. Uh, and then... So then they have this God of the earth, and then your uh, uh, Noah figure is also on there, who the piston. And in most of the cultures, his name will translate to exceedingly wise one. And they felt that he was immortal. And he lived 350 years after the flood. You know, so a lot of these stories uh, will talk about him as being immortal. Um, Tiamat, this is from the Ishtar Bay, and we we'll go back to that. that, that, that. You can go on that. So this is an image from the Ishtar Gate. The Ishtar Gate was found by 
German archaeologists have taken to Berlin, and it's reset up at the uh, Pergamum Museum in Berlin. Uh, Saddam Hussein did a one-third scale re uh, replica there at Babylon. And if you look online, you can see U.S. soldiers staring at these uh, uh, when they went over for Desert Storm uh, over there, having their pictures made. Now, if you look at this very carefully, you see that there is a horn, and it's actually a double horn. There's two sets. Uh, and then, does it, what does that look like? Snake. Yeah, it looks like a snake, doesn't it? Uh, so this is referred to as a dragon. It's an Ushu dragon. When you look at its body, what does it look like? Does it look like skin or fur? It looks like scales, right? And then look, you've got like bird's feet on the back and then you've got lion's feet. And so the common snake that is in this area throughout the Middle East, Arabia, um, and the land of Ur, and then also northern uh, Africa and Egypt is called the horned viper. And it's not the most venomous snake, a venomous snake in the world, but it, uh, it does have a bite and probably can kill a human. And as you look at that, uh, now this is my own uh, theory, but this has such a strong resemblance to that. And a, a lot of times, when you see the images and reliefs, they'll have a man and a woman and a tree and a serpent coming out in these ancient documents. And again, there's knowledge of the biblical record. Uh, they knew the things, but then it gets distorted over time and with the language changes. Uh, this is a, another close-up of this image here done uh, and this is Kiyama again here with legs. And then uh, there will be a figure standing on top of that where that is being subdued. So what we want to talk about now is where that particular relief was found, that cylinder seal was found in this area. Okay. And we're going to come back and put all these together and take a look at it. So then we have another, it's called the Atrahasis Babylonian Flood Story. And you see here there are two trees. Uh, oh, that doesn't show up as well here. Uh, so there's two tree looking figures here. And a lot of times, especially in the Assyrian versions of things, you get these trees that are being tended to, and but there's no, nothing in the writing that explains what these trees are. Uh, the early archaeologists called them trees of life, uh, or the tree of life, and uh, but there's really no uh, archaeological proof to give it that name. Uh, again, Atrahasis is here in this on the cylinder seal, and he is exceedingly wise. Uh, he is going to eventually take on the form of a half man, half fish. Cheryl, could you run over and it's the table that's closest against the wall where the chairs are? And there's a, actually it's on the Assyrian, uh, with the Assyrian stuff by the Taylor Prism. There's a little figure there that's got, it looks like a man and a fish. It's like it stands upright. Some even more 
and uh, they could be listing the, the years of the dynasty. The last king before the flood listed is the king of Shurapak, if I pronounce that correctly, and he is on that list. And uh, you know, some have surmised it could be the Noah that is of the Bible. We just don't know. But anyway, just for what that's worth. So this is the Babylonian flood story that's in the cylinder seal. And these cylinder seals uh, have a purpose to remind people about the floods. They're not just making this stuff up. It's from the biblical account of what happened, but they kind of massaged their own beliefs uh, into this. And they needed something to worship, and they began to worship the stars. This was found up by the northern part of the Tigris River. Then there's this one. And again, you see Tiamat, the dragon serpent, being ridden uh, by uh, their gods. And again, uh, you've got uh, Chaos, the serpent, and uh, being, uh, it looks like it's on waves. And so, and that was found at Susa. Susa is where Daniel was when he was put into the lion's den. Uh, that was the area of the Medes. And so that was discovered there. And then this is a uh, Babylonian account of the flood. And it's called the Genesis Tablet. And it dates to 1500 BC. There are seven tablets altogether. I've got uh, a replica of one of the tablets over there. And if you look at it, uh, in, does that come across okay? So <clears throat> you have uh, Utnapistum. Did you find it? No, that's fine. That's okay. So Utnapistum, the Noah character, is told to build an ark of equal size. Now that's the same as the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is this fellow right here. He seeks out the Noah character and ends up building an ark that is 120 by 120 by 120 cubits. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the tablets talk about the building, the stocking, and the launching of the ark. And it talks about the, the storm. And it is a devastating storm. And then the calm, and then sending out the birds. And I believe it's this uh, story that the birds get reversed. Uh, it's not the dove that brings back the, the olive branch. Uh, Utnapistum afterwards offers a sacrifice. In, this is interesting, in the Greek account of the flood, it's called the Deculian story. And the, the two Greek words make up uh, that they're the word sailor in the Greek and the word fresh new wine. What does Noah do when he, when he lands it? And that's the Greek version. They put, yeah, and that's. And then the Greek version, uh, Noah's wife has, is a redhead, which I don't know if that, that's just kind of interesting. So uh, they're granted immortality in this. And, you know, if, if Noah's living this long, I mean, that's why Gilgamesh seeks out Noah because he realizes he's mortal, and he wants to find out how he can live longer. All throughout history, people have searched for the fountain of youth or something to live longer, and uh, there's no different. And so he's basically given a second chance, but they have to start all over. So that was found at Nineveh, at the, the great Nineveh library. When Nineveh was found by the archaeologists, they used the Bible you know, the, the, many of the liberal archaeologists mock the Bible, and then when they find things, they say, well, this isn't exactly what you know, we read about in the Bible. Well, maybe the artifact could be an error. <laughs> you ever think about that? Uh, the ancient world never, the kings never wrote about defeats in battle, ever. They never wrote it because it, it signified weakness. Uh, the Bible tells us all the truth of the people's lives, good or bad. Uh, look at David. You know, God loved David, but David made mistakes also. 
Nineveh had been covered over with dirt. And then when the archaeologists began to dig down, uh, many of the, the people that lived in the area helped dig. And they were astonished at what they found. And they said, all the generations we have been farming from this land not knowing this great city was beneath there. Critics of the Bible said Nineveh never existed. There could have not been a city that large in ancient history. And then they found the city, and indeed it was a huge and large city. And then we have this particular uh, one. And what is nice about this one, it has, uh, it has language on it, and it was translated. And on the land fell a calamity, one unknown to man, one that had never been seen before, one which could not be withstood, a great storm from heaven, a land annihilating storm. That's somebody's signature. They put that on, and what does that sound like? They're worshiping the flood? It sounds like they're in fear of the flood, and they are warning other generations of what could happen. And so they were in fear of the, you know, of this. They they weren't celebrating the flood. They were remembering the flood in fear. And that was found uh, near Aleppo up in Syria. So here I've given you like less than a sampling of like 0.001% of some of these findings. And we look here at where they're all located. And look at the elevations that these are located at. Uh, they're not at sea level. And uh, this, this particular one is at least 60 miles from the nearest uh, river that, is, you know, that, that could even cause a regional flood. And archaeologists uh, will discount the Bible's uh, discussing the flood and say, well, it was just a regional or a very limited area of flood. All these cultures have a flood. The Chinese have a flood story. Uh, but in their flood story, the, uh, the Noah character and his wife, actually a brother and sister, when the communists came to power, they thought that promoted incest, so they suppressed and squashed it. Uh, many Chinese people I know have never heard that, and I learned it at the university when I uh, studied these things. Uh, there's the well Blundell prism, a uh, better, uh, more accurate version of it, the one at the British Museum. And that's the one that has the pre-flood kings listed there. What, a, what an incredible find. Uh, and I will say this over and over. In the first century, a man, uh, in the first century you had miracles confirming what the apostles were saying. But 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that these miracles are going to fade away. There's something better. And when that which is perfect is come, which is the written word, what we're going to have left is what? Faith, hope, and love, and the grace of Jesus' love. But God has given us in the last few hundred years a new science of archaeology that has been digging these things up that show us that here are other accounts of the flood. These people were in fear of the flood. And other biblical discoveries that prove the events in the Bible. The Bible is neither myth nor legend. It is the truth that all the other artifacts end up supporting. Uh, that's the writing on there. I'm sure you can't read that or see it, so we'll go on. The Epic of Gilgamesh. This was discovered uh, at Nineveh, at the Library of Nineveh. And this is the Assyrian version of Gilgamesh. This uh, carving, this relief built into the side of a mountain is, is very large. 
you know, I usually say things are 16 feet tall. For some reason, I started realizing, well, a lot of these things are about 16 feet tall. So I didn't know they even have a standard that they try to make things. But Gilgamesh. Now, this is believed to be around 2100 BC that the Assyrians had moved it up, uh, that uh, the king of Assyria put this in his library. There are 11 tablets of this story. Uh, they just recently discovered uh, another, so now there's 11. The story is Gilgamesh, I, I mentioned earlier, just realizes he's mortal. He goes looking for the Noah character, Utnapiska. He finds him up in northern Iraq, Iran area. And he goes up and he asks him, how did you survive the flood? And he tells him it was in an ark that was 120 by 120 by 120 cubits. Okay, well that doesn't parallel on the biblical account. That's the first thing, you know, liberal archaeologists would point out. But let's point out also that Pele who, uh, lived and is named after the division because it is caused by the chaos of the language. Couldn't there be some language division here? I mean, Abraham wasn't closely associated with Noah. They lived at the same time, but they were far apart. And couldn't there have been some sort of language barrier uh, prohibiting the, even the knowledge of uh, all those things? Uh, Gilgamesh is the first king of Ur, or the, of the Assyrians, what ended up becoming the Assyrians. Uh, he is their first king in their records. That's the original uh, image there, and it's uh, very, like I said, it's like 16 feet tall. What you, we want? Bring, you can bring that one. Huh? You can bring that one. No, no, no. no. Uh, because of the eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> the man named Theophilus G. Pinches. Uh, if you're going to ever study any of these things, I would suggest his book. Uh, and you can get this off iTunes for free. Uh, at least you could. Uh, up a couple of years ago, I haven't checked recently. The Atlas G. Pinch is an interesting individual. Um, his mind, his father uh, was involved in a, a trade, but the Atlas Pinches learned to read the Assyrian language almost on, on his own. And he worked at the uh, British Museum just translating things, and they had made attempts to translate. Uh, the uh, Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, and they called him Zidzabar. And so it was Pinches that discovered, no, they, you're mispronouncing this. You're getting all these words wrong, and so he corrected it. And then he wrote many books, and he lived up until around the 1930s. Uh, so in Genesis chapter 10, we want to look here, and remember, Gilgamesh is the first king of Eric. And so we have uh, five sons of, of uh, uh, Cush. Cush beget Nimrod later on. And he's further down the list of his sons. And the Bible says he began to be a mighty one upon the earth. It says it again in verse 9. And then it, the Bible says that he was, his kingdoms were with Babylon, Ur, Akkad, or Syria, and Kalna and Shinar. The Bible says he's the first king of those kingdoms. The Assyrians say Gilgamesh is the first king. Now, Theophilus Pinches, in his book on page 6, uh, shows us that he says Nimrod is the Gilgamesh. So let's take a look here. So uh, in Genesis, we have Noah. Uh, he lived after the, the flood 350 years. We already looked at that. Uh, after uh, the, the flood, he comes out, he plants a vineyard. Uh, we know the story that he gets drunk. Nimrod, whose name means rebellion, uh, is the mighty hunter before the Lord. Okay? And we don't know a whole lot about Nimrod, but the Bible 
uh, makes a point to call him a mighty hunter before the Lord uh, many times throughout, I think up to five times when he's mentioned. His kingdom was Babel, Eric, Akkad, and so on. So if you look at the Assyrian version of Gilgamesh, Noah is called Ut the Piston, and that he survived the deluge and the ark, and he lives afterward, uh, ages afterwards. He's outliving uh, generations of people. Gilgamesh is the first king of Uruk, according to their tradition. And Pinchas tells us that Gilgamesh is deified as a god to be worshipped after uh, his death, and his name is changed to Miradoc. So Marduk is a version of Miradoc, or the, uh, the language changed to the Babylonians. And this Gilgamesh character is the Baal to the Canaanites. He becomes the Baal to the Canaanites. Miradoc is the same version of Baal that it is for the Canaanites, though they don't sacrifice their children to him. Zeus to the Greeks, uh, and Zeus is Jupiter to the, the uh, Latin to the Romans. Meridoc means rebellion, the same as Nimrod's name. That's kind of interesting. Pinches looks at the etymology of the, the, the words and the language, and he is convinced that Nimrod and Gilgamesh are one and the same. Jeremiah mentions Meridoc the God of the Assyrians and uh, two times in Jeremiah chapter 50. Uh, the Greek legend, the Deucalion, and if I pronounce that right, so it's derived of two names, uh, from two words, and sweet new wine and sailor, or fisher, sea. And then Zeus, uh, Pinchus points out that Zeus is the Meridoc. All of this kind of comes together. The Canaanite, and we'll talk about this at another session, the Canaanite Baal, and be careful going out on the internet. There's a lot of illustrations that say the Canaanite Baal was a bullheaded figure, but they show you illustrations. They don't show you artifacts. All the Canaanite artifacts, Baal, has a mallet to strike the clouds. Many times he's standing on these sort of stilt things on his feet, I guess, so he can reach the clouds. And then he carries a lightning bolt. Zeus carries a lightning bolt. Uh, so the roots of all of this seem to take place through these legends where there are some biblical truths. Now, if Nimrod is Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh went up to find Noah, and find out how he survived the flood. It could be that Nimrod was there, and that was Nimrod that went up. And why would the dimensions of the ark be up? Any logical explanation? Language change. I can uh, associate with this because when I used to have to travel to China, uh, I had to learn some Chinese to try to get things. I had to learn colors, I had to learn numbers, uh, because if you didn't, your product would come in <laughs> unbelievably messed up. And so I can relate to see how these numbers and things like that, but think about it. Which would you rather go in? Noah's Ark, which is the ratio is perfect seagoing ratio, or would you rather go in Gilgamesh's version? Now, archaeologists and scholars will discount some of these things uh, because they do not believe the Bible. They do not want people to believe the Bible, but uh, Theophilus Pinches and these early, early archaeologists, some of the reasons they got into the field was because they were wanting to show more of these artifacts that proved the Bible. Josephus wrote in his Antiquities of the Jews in 94 AD that you could see Noah's Ark, it was still visible in his day. It was still visible. He wasn't writing about Noah or the Noah's Ark 
to tell you about that. The reason he even mentions it, he's talking about a queen and her prince, son, and they became Jewish proselytes. And they went down during the, the famine that Agabus prophesies about in the book of Acts. And they supplied grain and food to the people of Jerusalem. They allowed her to build a palace there in the old city of David. And when she died, she's buried. Her tomb is on the Mount of Olives. And he is talking about that her country, her that she ruled, was where Noah's Ark landed. And where is that? It's on the southeast side of Arad. Irving Finkel is a curator of the British Museum, pretty high up. Uh, interesting man to listen to if you ever get a chance. He's out on YouTube. He says, I don't know why everyone's looking on the west side of Mount Arab for Noah's Ark. All the ancient documents say exactly what Josephus said, that it landed on the southeast side of Arab. Why don't people go there looking for it? Because it's not safe. And the ones that want to go looking for Noah's Ark need to get funding to go, so they're going to look on the west side. And by the way, if you, they're telling us as of 2021 that they found Noah's Ark, and it's this. And they're showing you all these images, and it's amazing the links that they go to to try to make us believe they found Noah's Ark. And I will tell you, if they're looking on the west side personally, I don't even know if, if there's any parts of Noah's Ark that could be in existence today. I don't need to know it, but it would be interesting if they find it on the southeast side. But these kinds of false archaeologists only make people think the Bible uh, believing Christians are nothing but nuts because it's going to be found out that this is Noah's Ark, and it's not that hard. So the location of it is way over here on the west side. And it should, according to Josephus and the other accounts, be over in this area. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, where does he find Noah? Up in this area. So they're claiming the Noah's Ark is up here, and that's what you're looking at. So if you look at it on Google Maps, you can see it's water runoff or, or glacier runoff. And it just happened to get a, a, a shape that somebody says, well, this looks like a ship. And so uh, please don't take the bait for those kinds of things. So the Gilgamesh epic shows 120 by 120 cubits. The Bible gives us a perfect seagoing ratio. The oldest ship that they have uh, discovered is actually a, a relief on uh, in a pyramid of an Egyptian pharaoh. And it dates back near not long after the flood. It's called the a Punt ship. And Punt, P-U-N-T, was a place along the uh, African coast where they went to get spices and gold. They built a ship there, and they try to recreate it in an episode of Nova on, uh, for National Geographic. And uh, uh, I've got a model over there that someone has recreated of that ship. But it used rope on the outside to try to, to keep it together. And it doesn't use any sealers. It relies upon the uh, wood uh, soaking up the water and expanding to seal it. When they put it in the water, the replica, it was leaky. And so they began to take scraps of linen and sticking it inside their flax and sticking it in between the cracks. And then it finally swelled up enough. And then they went and sailed it. And there was a guy that was a sailor a uh, well-known uh, sailor that sailed a lot of the seas with uh, sailing craft. And he was afraid of it. He was afraid to go on it. But once they got going, he, but it's extremely awkward and heavy. It doesn't have a keel. And uh, it, 
is not very seaworthy. In World War II, the United States and, and Great Britain, Great Britain had the design and and they it was based on the ratios of Noah's Ark. They built nearly 3,000 of these ships and they named them Liberty ships and they sailed the Atlantic, they sailed the Pacific and they were sunk either by torpedoes or by faulty welds because the people that were making them were unskilled and uh, some of them did uh, rip but none of them sank due to high seas. Uh, they were extremely seaworthy when other ships around them in the convoys were sinking. They could hold 2,800 Jeeps, 440 Sherman tanks, million, 230 million rounds of rifle ammunition. There is one in San Francisco down by, uh, what's the name of that, Pier 39? Yeah. And SS Jeremiah O'Brien. If you've seen the movie Titanic the, with the Leonardo and DiCaprio, uh, that ship is used for the iceberg scene. And they took it out the, into the harbor, went under San Francisco Bridge, Golden Gate. You would think I ever lived there. Right? So they went out and they ran the engine backwards and it trembled like this, and that's how they uh, filmed that. It's about 10 foot uh, more narrow than Noah's Ark. And that was to give it some speed. It's, these are extremely slow vessels because they are so seaworthy, but they're not made for speed. And uh, they didn't care because the main thing was to get the cargo where it was needed. And speed wasn't the, the most essential thing. I believe Noah's Ark was more of a barge looking vessel and everyone gets excited and says, did you see the Ark in Kentucky? Dad, you've got to go there. And I said, well, they can build it with one door and one window. I'll go take a look. But until they uh, can do that, I won't even bother. If you're going to build Noah's Ark, do it right. <laughs> That's what I had to say. This is a picture of that ship that they built, and it's the relief there. And you can see the ropes here. Uh, that uh, they believe held it together on the ends and very difficult uh, for them to build that. I want to give you a little bit of a bonus here and this is something that I did as a hobby. I went to Mesa Verde and I had gone to Mesa Verde many times as a, as a young boy and my parents had a vacation for us to, to go there. Been to Mesa Verde many times. I took my daughters there when they were, uh, what, six and four? Oh, no, like nine and ten. Nine and ten. Okay, so we went there, and the thing that really chapped me at the museum there at Mesa Verde is <clears throat> they have discovered all of these shark teeth, whale bones, eels, uh, you, you name it, ocean mammals and fish. And they said the Anastasi Indians happened to put their trash heap on where this hard collection of fossil bed was at. Uh, why couldn't they have been eating these things? You know, why it was in their trash, so why couldn't it? Well, I got ahead of myself. So before we go there, uh, let's look at the ark one more time. And you know the lines that you see on the ships? Uh, it has a name. It's at, named after this man, uh, Samuel Plimsoll. And that's called the Plimsoll Line. And the British were losing a lot of ships at sea, losing a lot of sailors because they were overloading the ships. And so he came up with a formula, a basic formula, and then it has even been refined even further for ships today, and depending on the solidity of the ocean. But the basic formula is one half the height of the ship. Now, let's figure out what the arc's plimsoll line would be. So it's 30 cubits high. So what would be the, the plimsoll line for the ship if it's one half? 15 cubits. 15 cubits. 
So Genesis 6. Uh, David, read that for me. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lifted lift above the earth. And the water prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the water prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills, and there and that were under the whole heaven were covered, fifteen cubits upward. And the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. What was the plimsoll line of the ark? Fifteen cubits. God raised the water over the highest mountain. So they, and someone might say, hey, you know, at Everest you can't breathe at that high. If it covered Everest that high, uh, people die. They call it the death zone. So how could Noah uh, and his animals survive? Well, one, God can do anything, but let's look at the other. Right now, Everest is how many feet above sea level? 30,000, right? What was sea level when Noah and the waters were rising? Wherever Noah was at at the time, right? So sea level adjusted, uh, most likely, and uh, God watched over. So we just recovered that, so we we'll move on here. Uh, there are people out there that you know say that they are uh, very uh, extremely smart, and they said there is not enough water on the planet today to uh, cover all the mountains. And we see that in the book of Genesis that the water, the earth was in water and out of water, and it seems that there is some sort of there, there's a difference in the earth pre-flood than there is post-flood. And Second Peter tells us this, that, that uh, and they willfully forget that the word of God, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded by the water. The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire. What comes up out of the ground through the volcanoes? Fire. What came up through the ground uh, in the book of Genesis when the flood began? It came from above and it came from below. The earth opened up and spewed water. The earth that is now is reserved with fire. Peter has already trumped the gainsayers explaining how there would have been enough water. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Fire is truth. Count on the word. Okay, this is this is free. So the cliff dwellings I started talking about earlier. If you look at Mesa Verde, and I look at that, that looks like a, where the water will eat out, like it's a, like a river will eat that out. And this is Chimney Rock in Colorado. Why on earth would people go up there to live from down in that valley? And they say, well, there were these uh, uh, very uh, aggressive tribes that were killing them, which, by the way, they never found even one arrowhead of any aggressive tribe. There's no evidence of that, but that's what they say. Every cliff dwelling or high altitude dwelling of the Indians that's the nice thing about Google is you can look at that all of these are within a few hundred feet of each other New Mexico, Colorado Arizona did they have altimeters and say hey we're almost uh, 6800 feet you know let's build right here or were they working their way down and on the Americas over here, after the flood, there was a giant lake, seawater, and it was uh, an inland sea. And then at one day, it began to come down. And then one day, it was all gone, and all of these uh, Anastasia Indian settlements ended about the same time period. Why? Because they can put down part of the, the lowlands now. 
they're no longer catching sea animals. They're going to have to make grain and other types of wildlife. It makes a lot more sense. And if you look at it from space, and if you look at this, oh, boy, that's really launched out there. Um, let's go to this one. You see these, uh, these little wrinkles? You know, of course, these are mountainous and rocks and everything. Did you know the end of the, the uh, Grand Canyon is higher than the beginning? I believe that this all washed out in a very quick time. I think it was like leaking down. This is my opinion. And it was leaking down and all washed out in a very quick time. When I was a kid on the farm and we did irrigation, I would build dams in the furrows while my dad slept waiting for the water to get down and he'd sleep in the, the pickup there. You know? And so I would build dams, which probably if he knew what I was doing, he'd probably be upset, but I built dams in the furrows. And I would watch these things over and over and how they would break loose. And see this? This looks exactly like when the water would bust loose all at once and just come, come out and it would just wash everything away except the heaviest sands and dirts. And it would also make sense because in Greek literature, remember they have the, the city of Atlantis? They talk about cities that were buried underwater. At some point, uh, since the flood in the Greek writings, there has been a sea level rise that went up very quickly and buried a lot of the coastal cities. And they wrote about this. And I think some event like this could very well have caused that. Now that's my opinion. Uh, you can take it for what it's worth. When I was at uh, Mississippi, and I gave this, there was two uh, archaeologists that came and I was giving this lecture and they said you know we've never thought about that and I said well if you if you use it just uh, if you don't mind give me credit for it because you know I kind of did this part on my own and uh, so they went back and I guess I've been quoted by MIT <laughs> I don't know if it's for this but uh, I never looked it up but uh, they were pretty excited about it, and uh, I was surprised that they liked my museum because they had been to a lot of places. There.